what part of the Godhead went down to hell? Got an email here, friend of the ministry. Going to read it. Hey, Brian, quick question. Can you please give me your thoughts on what the Bible teaches about the Godhead in this passage? Considering the soul of the Godhead is the Father, Jesus is the body, and the Holy Ghost is the Spirit, that would mean the Father went to hell and to the heart of the earth for three days after the death on the cross and before the resurrection. Question. What part of the Godhead is the He being satisfied by seeing the travail of, quote-unquote, His soul? What part of the Godhead is the Lord, quote-unquote, who is pleased to bruise Him, quote-unquote, and make His righteous, servant, righteous servant's soul an offering for sin? Is the Father talking to Himself? Does Jesus have His own separate soul in this passage? Um, how could Jesus be the one who went to hell? Because Jesus is the body of the Godhead, and the Bible says the body laid in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea for three days. The soul is the part of the Godhead that went to hell, which the soul, which the soul is the Father. However, the Father is not called the Son of Man, which goes against Matthew, 20, Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. This has, caused us, this has confused us for a while, and we would like your thoughts slash explanation when you can. Thanks. This email here, you can see it's all kind of crinkled up and everything else. I've been carrying this thing around, and occasionally I'll, I'll get some time, free time, and I'll just kind of take it out and I'll read it, and I'll think, okay, and I'll go to the Bible, and I'll say, all right, Lord, what, what's the answer here? Well, that's what this study is about. So I'm going to answer this. We're going to go to the different scriptures involved. And uh, we'll see. Okay. So what part of the Godhead went to hell, according to the King James Bible? Well, Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. Let's go there. Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. Matthew 12, verse 40. And please, you know, as I say in so many of my studies, turn in your King James Bible. Don't just don't just listen to this thing and whatever. You need it when you're studying the Bible and when you're going through these things and, and these debates and whatever with Scripture. Um, you need to actually look at the passage. There's there's a spiritual thing there. The Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. I'm not your authority, all right? Nobody else on YouTube is your authority. The Bible is your authority. Okay, very very important. So. If you're just listening to me, and I understand you, some of you do that while you're working or whatever else, but this is a deep study, right? You need to actually go and look at the scriptures and let the Lord speak to you from His Word. You know, there's an old saying, and that is, this King James Bible is the only book that has the author present every time you read it, okay? He will be the one that will guide you into all truth. That's why I make it such a big deal. Get your King James Bible. Sit down. You, yes, you can listen to this study, audio or whatever else, or however you do it. Listen to the study. But if you have questions, then you go back and you, you watch this thing again, and you actually look up the Scriptures and, and read them, and let the Holy Spirit speak to you through the Scriptures. It's very important. Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Okay? The Son of Man. Now, God the Father is never called the Son of Man. You say, well, then they're two different beings. They're two different persons. Uh, no, um, because they're one and the same you know, being. It's God. There are no other gods in the King James Bible. There's no three separate people that all call themselves God. Uh, that's heresy. That's Trinitarian pagan philosophy that's come in and corrupted people. Um, the Trinitarian, I've seen so many good preachers, and they have, you know, parts of the Godhead right, but then they try to merge it with Trinitarian philosophy, and it gets all jumbled to pieces. I used to do that myself, all right? But you can see the Son of Man is clearly there in the heart of the earth, right? And in, in, in reference there to hell, okay? In the Old Testament, there was... The heart of the earth contained both Abraham's bosom and hell. In spite of what the new IFB, you know, little wing nuts try to teach, that Jesus had to go to hell and burn, you know, and, and some say he's still burning there, you know. It's insane. Um, so we see, did Jesus go down to the heart of the earth? Yes. Okay, now what about the soul? Acts chapter 2. Go to Acts chapter 2. And we'll see about this. Peter preaching to people here. And he gets into this thing. Preaching to the Jews. 
Acts chapter 2, verses 31 through 32. He seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. Okay? Verse 32. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. All right? So, what's the soul in reference to there? Well, you know, uh, verse 31. Resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell. Does it say that the soul is Jesus Christ? Well, no, but it says his soul. Okay, then Jesus Christ has a separate soul than the Father. I mean, when you get into any kind of debate, argument, whatever you want to call it, uh, with heretics, you have to think about, okay, you're, you're trying to make my side, my belief system look bad, but what are you trying to sway me over to believe? You see, what do you want me to, how do you, when, you, when I change my belief to yours, what do I have to come away with? And what the Trinitarian thing actually teaches, which is insanity, is that you have three separate, completely separate beings. And they're all going around saying, I'm the one true God. I'm the one true God. No, I'm the one true God. No, I am. You know, it's, it's insane. Or I guess they don't really argue. They all just accept, you know, we're all the one true God. You know, they can't add. The God of the universe can't add. There's three separate people in heaven, and yet they all just go, we're one God. They share the title of God, but they're all just one God. Three gods, but one God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. You know, I mean, the, the Trinitarian God is an idiot God that has basically three separate people, and they, can only, they can't count. They just go, just one. We're just one God, but we're not all one God. We're not all the same being. We're not one person. We're three separate persons, but one God. And we call, we're called by three separate names, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, but we're just one God. I don't worship a, a idiotic God like that, sorry, or gods like that. Got to get it right. Um, <laughs> yeah, but uh, please note there in verse 32, what does it say? This Jesus hath God raised up. Okay. Um, who's it talking about in context? Well, that in context would be the Father. God raised up Jesus, right? Turn to John chapter 2, verse 19. John 2, verse 19. Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days God will raise it up. No, it says that I will raise it up. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? So there are times when Jesus is speaking and there's no difference between the Father and Himself. Over here in Acts chapter 2, verse 32, this Jesus hath God raised up. John chapter 2, verse 19, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. He doesn't say my Father in heaven will raise it up, even though... Acts chapter 2, verse 32 says that it was the Father, God. And then you, you know, the Trinitarians will go, well, you see, but God there in Acts 2, 32 was God the Son. <laughs> uh, that doesn't even make any sense. You know, this Jesus hath God the Son raised up. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. Uh, no, the Father and the Son Oftentimes, there's separation there between, you know, soul and body. Absolutely. But they're spoken of as being one and the same. Why? Because it's the same being. One being. One person. Okay? But here you go. You say, well, well then, see? Acts chapter 2, verse 31 says the soul was down there in hell. Soul, you know, wasn't left in hell. Uh, Matthew chapter 12, verse 40 says that, you know, the Son of Man was in the heart of the earth. So, um, they have to be two separate persons. Uh, got an even better one for you. Turn in your Bible to Psalm 139. What about the third member of the Holy Trinity? There is no third member of the Holy Trinity. That's not even in Scripture. Only a deluded pagan papist would say such things. Such vile blasphemy against the Lord Jesus Christ. Third member. Second member. Uh, chapter and verse, please. There isn't any. Psalm 139, verse 7 through 10. 
Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Hmm. Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. Is the Holy Spirit in hell? Mm -hmm. He's omnipresent. It's kind of an interesting thing. I mean, I'm not going to teach that, that God's presence is hell, but you know, the Bible also calls you know, our God is a consuming fire. When we get judged, it's the, the judgment seat of Christ. You know, our works are burned up by fire. Hmm. Kind of an interesting thing there. But the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit there, is in hell. You say, oh, he's suffering down there. No, he's not suffering. God controls everything. Again, you know, it's so weird. Some of the different systems out there, it's always kind of, you know, well, God's not all powerful. You know, the first seven seals of the tribulation aren't really God. It's the devil doing that type of thing there. Uh, so says the new IFB. Um, you know, Jesus had to burn in hell to pay for our sins, as says the new IFB. Um, you know, Jesus is the second member of the Trinity. It's, it's all this stuff about tearing God down. God doesn't really create evil to punish a wicked nation. God just kind of stands back biting his fingernails and going, oh no, oh no, oh no. You know, you see? God isn't really in control of hell. That's the devil. He sits down there on his flaming throne, you know, looking cool or whatever else. Uh, no, God controls everything. Every single thing in this universe is controlled by the Godhead. Okay? Verse 9. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the earth, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. Who's he referring to here? Who's David referring to in this passage? The Spirit. Verse 10, Even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. John chapter 10 Go back to John chapter 10. Keep your hand there in Psalm 139 and go to John 10. John 10, your King James Bible. John chapter 10, verse 28 through 30. And I shall give and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand, Jesus speaking. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one, uh, two separate persons that are one in divine essence, unity, happiness. No, um, just one. That's why Jesus Christ is holy, completely God. Don't demote him. Don't tear him down, Trinitarians. Okay? But isn't it interesting that Psalm 139, back there, flip back to verse 10, and thy right hand shall hold me. John chapter 10, verse 28. Uh, yeah, 28. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand, Jesus. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, verse 29, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. So the Bible teaches that we are in the hand of the Spirit, Psalm 139, verse 10, and we are in Jesus' hand, John chapter 10, verse 28, and we are in the Father's hand, John chapter 10, verse 29. Um, how does that work if they're all three separate people, three separate persons? Yeah, I said that, you know, maybe the, the father and the son are up there playing catch with catch the Christian, you know. They just keep throwing back and forth, but then you wouldn't be in their right hand all the time, you know. See, because you're in the air for a little while until you get caught by the other one. But it's even worse, because I guess according to the Trinitarians, that they're three separate persons, they're actually playing, you know, uh, you know, throw the Christian between all three of them. And maybe the devil's in the middle playing, you know, kind of monkey in the middle. He's trying to catch the Christian or something like this. <laughs> it's... it's Weird. Uh, or you could just believe what the Bible teaches about the Godhead and say, no, they're actually just three parts to one being. Body, soul, spirit. There you go. Not that hard. That's how we can be in the Holy Spirit's hand and in the Father's hand and in the hand of Jesus. You get it? So you say, well, the, the Bible says that 
there's the soul in hell and Jesus went down to the heart of the earth and the spirits down in hell as well. Hmm, how does that work out? Um, because it's one being, you see. So you can speak in some ways. There's that separation there, certainly. Body, soul, spirit. Absolutely. I'm not a modalist. You can speak of the separation, but in other ways you're looking and you're saying, okay, there's just one being. So it's not incorrect to, incorrect to say the soul went down to hell. Not incorrect to say that at all. But now let's go to Isaiah 53, because this was another part of the question. Isaiah 53, the prophecy of the coming Messiah for the Jewish people. And, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to be real straight with you. The Bible says great is the mystery of godliness. All right. Uh, there are some aspects of the Godhead that we are just not going to get. We're not going to understand it. All right. I can't stand here and say, oh, you know, I have it all figured out. I am the, the greatest scholar of the 21st century. Brian Denlinger is the greatest preacher that's ever. You know, pff, give me a break. I'm not anything like that. Um, there's a lot of things I'm, I'm just, I look at and I say, well, I believe your word, Lord. I don't understand this, but I know what the other verses say, and I can't change my position because that contradicts other scriptures. And so I can look at something and I can say, okay, I don't quite get the wording there. Maybe this, you know, this isn't really written to me. This is a prophecy for the Jewish people. So you kind of scratch your head and you think, okay, I, I don't get it, you know. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Isaiah 53, verses 10 through 12. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sins, the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Okay? Now, um, we'll get to this whole thing, kind of break this down here as we go on. But I just want you to notice something. Okay? Notice there's a shift here. Verse 10, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Well, you would assume that's the Father bruising the Son. Jesus is on the earth, the Father is in heaven, the soul there and everything. Please the Lord to bruise him. He would be the Father, hath put him, Jesus the Son, to grief. But now look at this. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. Why does it switch from he to thou? You say, well, it's just it still means the Father. Does it? I don't know. I mean, I, again, I'm looking at this thing and I went over this and over this and over this. I don't know how many times I read these verses and I just said, Lord, I don't get it. And, and you know, I'm not going to listen to some stuffed shirt out there, some educated, pompous, you know, guy that just, I'm a master's degree in such and such or whatever else. And all the clear teaching is, you don't know the clear teaching, you know. I don't, I don't listen to theological books and whatever else like that. You know, I'll take some things maybe, but, but uh, they're not at my authority. The Holy Spirit's my authority. And again, like I said at the beginning of this study, okay, let's just say that the Trinitarians are right. And this proves that Jesus Christ had his own soul. And the Father has his own body, soul, spirit in heaven. Do you realize how many scriptures that contradicts? Do you realize how much error that would introduce into the Bible? I mean, Jesus Christ, by him all things consist. And that means that the Father and the Holy Spirit, both they live from, the Holy, from, from Jesus Christ being there for them. Then how did Jesus die on the cross? I mean, so many arguments against the thing of them having their own bodies. You know, just terrible type of stuff. But when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. Again, what does that mean? You know, I don't know. I don't know. Could it be a reference to the Jewish people? You know, that they are making his soul an offering for sin? I'm going to be quite honest with you. I don't know. You say, well, but, uh, um, you know, the father didn't, he didn't have any part of, of, of paying for the sins and things like that. Oh, I don't know about that. Keep your hand there in Isaiah 53. Go over to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. 
Verse 28, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Now what do you do with that? When did God the Father die on the cross and shed his blood? You say, well, no, that's a reference to God the Son. Okay, adding to Scripture again, Trinitarians, um, it doesn't say God the Son. All right? Um, God purchased us with his own blood. So God has a, you just say, you know, for, for sake of argument here, that you, you're a Trinitarian, you don't believe that God is the soul of the Godhead. Obviously, a soul does not have blood. Um, but let's just say God has his own body. Okay, when did he shed his blood? You have to come up with some new doctrine now. Well, you see, when Jesus went up and, and um, you know, he, he was there in heaven and, and uh, maybe he just kind of, you know, walked up behind his father and pricked him, you know, or something. He got a little needle and got him and, and ah, what are you doing here, you know, son? Oh, I just had to get your blood there so you could purchase the church with it or something, you know. See? Or you can just say, you know what? The Godhead is Jesus, the body, the Father, the soul, the Holy Ghost, the Spirit. And there's times that the Bible just kind of blends them together because they're one and the same being. How does it? Well, you have to explain it perfectly. I can't. I can't. I can't explain God perfectly. Again, if I could explain God and understand everything about God, He wouldn't be worth worshiping. Not at all. But see, again, go back to Isaiah 53. And what happens is, these Trinitarians, again, they will go and they will, they will demote Jesus Christ. They'll put down Jesus Christ. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Like I said, obviously, it's the Father bruising the Son. He, the Father, hath put him, the Son, to grief. When thou, whatever you want to make that into, thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. Well, what's his soul? Well, I believe it's the Father. Because again, it's not Jesus in, in some separate, he's some separate being or whatever else. No, he's actually God, holy and completely God. And he's not the Father in the sense of that there's no, there's no difference between the two or something like that. Um, but he carries the same title as God the Father, all right? They're the same being. Again, you know, your, your brain starts to go to pieces if you really get into this thing. And you say, okay, explain this exactly. I trust, I trust what the Bible says. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. You know, set thou at my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. You know, there's prophecies that God gave that his son is going to rule and reign physically on the earth. I mean, think about this. God is going to come to the earth and provide a way of salvation for all men. He's going to come and he's going to live in a body like we live and everything else that's subject to the pains and the sickness and death and everything. You know, he's going to have that. How's he going to come and get a body? He creates his own body. People say, well, you created it without pain. Uh, how, you know, how's that fair? Whatever else. He has to be born. Okay. Now he's going to be born of a woman. And what's he supposed to do? Who's he going to say his father is? You see? He has to come and he has to say, my father is in heaven. But that doesn't mean that, that there's some kind of a, uh, you know, that, that Jesus, when he's up in heaven, is, is some kind of little, you know, simpering little, little child that walks around and his, his dad's, you know, Jesus, get in here. You need to clean your room or something. No, they're, Jesus is all powerful. All right. Again, this Trinitarian thing, when you really get into understanding what it's all about, it's always tearing Jesus down. It's always demoting Jesus. Jesus is not Almighty God. He's just the second member of the Trinity. He's, he's, he's in this lower position, right? But the Lord Jesus Christ could say to the Father, you go down there to hell. Does he have the authority to do that? If he's God, he does. You see? Well, you say, but you have to explain it. I can't explain it. You can't explain it. There's no Trinitarian that can explain every single part of this whole Godhead thing. You can't. Um, again, verse 11. He shall see of the travail of his soul. All right. Jesus shall see of the travail of his soul, the Father. All right. 
and it's not it's not you know his the father's soul or something or whatever else. No, it's it's Jesus Christ seeing the travail of the soul that he has, which is the Father. And shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. All right? Again, you know, it's it's all just it's the Godhead that, that's there down in hell, and you know how that whole thing worked and whatever else, I don't know. But again, to take this and say, well then I'm just gonna throw out all the all the stuff about the Godhead and that, that they're, you know, one and the same being. And I'm going to start saying that they're three separate beings, three separate people. You know, they use the word persons, but, you know, you get right down to it. They're teaching it's three separate people with their own body, soul, and spirit. And you have huge problems when you teach that. So, um, but now, here's another thing I want to, another point I want to bring up just to kind of illustrate what I'm trying to say with this whole thing. That there are some portions of the scripture you just look at and you say, well, that's what the Bible teaches, right? What part of the Godhead, we talked about in this study, what part of the Godhead went to hell? The answer to that question is all three parts, all right? Plain and simple. The Holy Spirit is in hell all the time. Psalm 139 talked about that. 139, get my scripture reference right. Psalm 139 verse uh, 10 talked about that. Holy Spirit's in hell all the time. The Father, there, the soul, you know, went to hell. Jesus Christ, the body, was three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Gives you the location of hell, by the way, too. Interesting. So you see, all three parts of the Godhead are spoken of as doing the same thing. And I'll give you, you say, well, that's ridiculous. Oh, this is ridiculous. You can't, you can't answer it, so that's all the better you can come up with. Well, this is another one of the points that I've used to disprove this whole Trinity, Trinitarian, pagan nonsense that there's three separate people. All right. What part of the Godhead went to hell? All three parts. Second question. What part of the Godhead is in you as a born-again Christian? Hmm. Second Corinthians chapter 13. Go there. Second Corinthians chapter 13. And verse 5. Examine yourselves, whether ye, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. Is Jesus Christ in the body of a, of a Christian? Yes. Uh, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Jesus Christ says to Saul, later became Paul, on the road to Damascus. Saul, Saul, why, why persecutest thou me? Well, he didn't persecute Jesus Christ physically but he's persecuting, persecuting Christians. Hmm. Okay. Colossians 1.27. Colossians 1.27. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. All right. Is Jesus Christ in a Christian? Yes. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 6. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 6. What about God the Father? One God and Father of all. Is it clear who it's talking about? Yes. Who is above all and through all and in you all. Talking to Christians, by the way. Not in everybody out there. Uh, it doesn't work. Um, it says that the Father is in you as a Christian. But we just read in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5, and Colossians 1, 27, that Jesus Christ is in a Christian. How can Jesus Christ and the Father both be in you as a Christian? But what about the Holy Spirit? Romans chapter 8. Here it gets really fun. Romans chapter 8, verses 9 through 11. The Bible says here, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so, be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Wait a second here. The Spirit of God dwell in you, the Spirit of Christ. The Spirit of God or the Spirit of Christ? Wait a second. Trinitarian belief 
there's three separate persons. Each one has their own body, soul, spirit. So apparently, we have both the Spirit of God as the Father and the Spirit of Christ. We have two spirits in us, apparently. Or it's just the same Spirit. Okay? Think about that. Verse 10. Okay, it's talking about the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ in you. And if Christ be in you, no, 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 no. The Spirit of Christ. Uh, no, it goes on to say, and if Christ be in you. Tying the Spirit of Christ to Christ. You see. He doesn't say, and also, if you also have the Spirit of, you know, of, of if, if Christ be in you. No, 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 no. Spirit of God, Spirit of Christ, and if Christ be in you. The body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Wait a second. If Christ be in you, the spirit is life. So Christ and the spirit are spoken of as being the same? It's kind of synonymous there? Mm-hmm. So then it wouldn't be a problem for me to say that uh, the Godhead was present. All three parts of the Godhead were present in hell. No. It's not a problem at all. Verse 11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. <laughs> what did we read earlier? The father raised him up. Jesus raised himself up. And now it says the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. The spirit raised Jesus up. Hmm. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. What do you do with that as a Trinitarian? That teaches three separate beings, each with their own body, soul, spirit, body, soul, spirit, body, soul, spirit. And I've heard people say, you know, I've heard Trinitarians, they'll say, we don't believe that. We believe that they're three separate persons, but they don't each have their own body, soul, spirit. <laughs> um then what you're trying to teach is the Godhead, okay? But you're using this unbiblical term, persons. You know, I've heard people say recently, entities. You know, it's three different entities. It's still not a Bible term. You know, just go with what the Bible teaches. Man is created in God's image. Body, soul, spirit. It's not really that difficult, okay? There are certain parts of the Godhead and how things worked out, whatever. Yeah, you, you don't, aren't going to get that. Great is the mystery of godliness. Nobody's arguing that point. But when you start to say, I have to adopt this Trinitarian philosophy, you are doing exactly what Colossians... Let's go to Colossians here real quickly. Just I want to get it exactly right. And I want you to see it too. It's very important that you see this. Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Colossians 2, verses 8 and 9 describes this whole Trinity versus Godhead thing perfectly. Describes it to a T. Verse 8, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy. Again, I've showed the Catholic Catechism. They plainly say that the doctrine of the Trinity comes from, uh, is there, a lot of the words and terminology comes from philosophy. They're honest about it. Okay? Just a lot of people who call themselves Bible-believing Bible Christians, they're dishonest. Kind of a problem. You get Catholics in their catechism, they're honest, and say, yeah, we took it from philosophy. And Rabbi Zacharias, I showed that, you know, his video where, where he actually stands up and says it comes from philosophy. These guys are honest. But then you get people who try to say that they're King James Bible believers, and they say, it's not from philosophy. They're lying. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the, after the tradition of men, Catholics, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him... Christ dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. It's right there. So how could Jesus Christ go down there to, to hell and the Father as the soul and the spirit not be there? How could Jesus Christ shed his blood on the cross and yet that blood not be connected at all with the Father? Um... This issue has caused a lot of division. And it's not because of people like me that just... I'm, all I'm trying to advocate is people just stick with the King James Bible. 
All right. I teach what I teach from the King James Bible. Okay. And I don't have to add persons. I don't have to add Trinity or Trinitarian or Triune or all this other stuff. I teach what the Bible teaches. All you Trinitarians out there, you have to add a whole bunch of stuff to it. Add philosophy and it spoils you. You could be doing good work for the Lord. And yet all you do is you just have to go back and you just have to, to, to damn people to hell who say, I don't believe in the Trinity thing. And then you say, all oh, these, how dare you know, heretics like Denlinger you know, come out and he makes this a salvation issue. You're making it a salvation issue. And you just, you, you, you say the same things that the Catholic Catechism does. That the very core doctrine of Christianity is the Trinitarian teaching. The whole teaching of the Trinity. Uh, that's not the core doctrine. The core doctrine of Christianity is we have a book. And this book is magnified above God's name. This book is more important than the Trinity. All right? Far more important than the Trinity. This book is more important than salvation. This book is the, is the physical words of the living God, the God of the universe. And we need to be a, a, all about defending this book and using this book to define what we believe in. This book is the most important thing out there. You don't want to follow it? Well, you're not going to get very far. So that is going to be it. I hope that, that answers the question. I mean, there's there's stuff. How does this work out? Isaiah 53 type of thing and whatever else. Um, Isaiah 53, I believe Jesus Christ fulfilled that when he came. But there's some things about millennial inheritance there, the thousand year reign of Jesus. Okay, I don't millennial and kingdoms on the king. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. Thousand years, a thousand means millennial and millennium. Thousand-year reign of Christ. Okay, there's stuff about that there in Isaiah 53. Some of the reign that Jesus Christ is going to get. He hasn't fulfilled that stuff yet. Okay, some of what's going to be happening with with uh, interpretation of Isaiah 53 and whatever else, I believe is going to be for the Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble. Um, the Melchizedek teaching in the book of Hebrews. I believe that Moses and Elijah are going to be preaching that to the Jews because right now the big stumbling block to a Jew is this whole Trinitarian teaching. The Bible says very plainly in the Old Testament that the, the Messiah is one God. He is one Lord. Okay, A son is given. His name shall be Everlasting Father. Okay, So the Jew, an Orthodox Jew, comes along and they see the Trinitarian teaching and they say, oh, no, nope, sorry, can't understand that. Can't, you know, I don't want to believe in that. That stuff's pagan. And it is. You know? And so in the time of Jacob's trouble, I believe that there are certain things that are going to be preached and taught by Moses and Elijah, the two witnesses of Revelation chapter 11. And those things are going to, the Jews, the, the blinders are going to come off. That spirit of blindness that the Lord gave them in, in Romans chapter 11, that's going to go away. And now signs and wonders. Hey, if the book of Revelation is not true, if, the, if, you, if you're supposed to reject the, the New Testament, then uh, why are these signs and things coming true here in the book of Revelation? Look at this. Look at that. You see. And the Jews all of a sudden are going to say, wow, it's all going to be made clear to them and, and plain. Um, but I'm not going to abandon the teaching of the Godhead simply because of some prophecies in the Old Testament, Isaiah 53, that don't, I don't quite understand everything and how it works out exactly. Um, I'm not ashamed to say that I'm ignorant in some issues. I'm not ashamed to say that there's per parts of the Bible I don't understand. The Lord hasn't revealed it to me. Um, and people come out and they say, well, you know, we have, you know, books on theology and whatever else you look at. Anytime you look at a book of theology and I've looked at a bunch of them and read through some of the stuff, these guys are some of the biggest idiots that you ever want to read. Okay. They'll come up with some things and you say, oh yeah, that's, that's what the Bible teaches. That's, that's fine. And then they'll come up with other things and you think, what, <laughs> you know, the systematic theology and all this other garbage garbage. Don't waste your time with it. The book. The book. King James Bible. So that is going to be it. Um, and we'll see you in the next video.